Good evening, everyone. Um, this is Stephen Horn, and with me is Thomas Easley, and uh, we're from the School of Modern Herbal Medicine. And tonight we're doing a webinar, Why Herbs? And a couple of things prompted uh, me to want to do this webinar. One of them was the fact that I turned 60 next year and was thinking about how you know, many people my age have all these health problems or all these medications, and I don't take any medications. I uh, <laughs> take some natural remedies. I'm a lot better shaped than most people my age, and uh, and also I'm getting ready to update a couple of our herbal courses and so forth. And so I just thought, hey, you know, let, we need to talk about why herbs are important. Besides, I the, the other thing was there's such a trend in the industry towards nutraceuticals. I also wanted to talk about, you know, why why herbs? You know, herbal medicine has been the mainstay of humanity for thousands of years. Um, we have recorded uh, history of using herbs in India and China that goes back 2,500 years. We have recorded history of herbs being used in Greece, Greek and Roman times that go back about the same. Uh, the tradition in the West is more broken than the traditions in the East, but still we have you know, records of people using herbs that far back. And even today, 25% of all modern medicines are made from uh, traditional medicinal plants. In other words, they're compounds that have been extracted for, from plants. Uh, they may be synthesizing them instead of just using them from you know, uh, uh, the extract from plant, but it's still as a compound that was originally derived from a plant. And many more of the drugs are basically synthetic analogs of compounds found from plants, or in other words, uh, compounds found from plants that have been uh, slightly modified. So my journey with this uh, herbal thing started uh, 45 years ago. Um, and I had been, uh, this, that's a picture of me around the, uh, that age or a little bit older. I loved being outdoors. I loved camping. And I was in Boy Scouts, and I had uh, was studying edible and medicinal wild plants. And I had a, actually I was studying uh, plant identification, and my field guide had information about Native American uses of plants. And I became fascinated with that. And one day as I had eaten some stinging nettle for the first time, I actually had harvested stinging nettle and cooked it. Um, I was thinking how cool it was that I'd just eaten a wild plant. And uh, as I was contemplating the uses of a lot of plants around me, uh, this little thought popped into my head, well, if you were a loving God, wouldn't you have put everything naturally on the face of the earth to take care of your children? And that thought has stuck with me ever since. I really believe that, you know, in, within nature is everything that we need to um, to not only survive but to thrive. After all, every other creature in nature is provided for, both with their their food and their medicine. So, Thomas. Um, yeah. So my um, my journey in this started a little bit differently. Uh, Eighteen years ago, um, uh, my twin sister got really sick, and uh, we were both thirteen years old and that uh, to make a, a long, drawn-out story short and uncomplicated, uh, after my mother took my sister to several doctors and five specialists, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, an herbalist uh, sat down and figured it out in, you know, just like 15 or 20 minutes, and uh, this uh, Southern herbalist with like an eighth grade education was able in seven days to totally correct all of my sister's chronic problems that the best doctors uh, all across the southeast couldn't figure out. And uh, it intrigued me because, you know, here we had been placing these uh, doctors up on a pedestal with their, you know, vast education and experience and uh, uh, a backwoods herbalist knew enough to ask a few simple questions that doctors hadn't thought of and uh, figured it out and, and fixed my, my twin sister. And that really meant a lot to me. And uh, uh, shortly thereafter, my mother received some, some help from uh, this herbalist. And uh, uh, I saw both of them getting over their chronic health problems. And I had some chronic health problems myself. And so I started studying uh, with this herbalist when I was 13. And, uh, 
spent some, um, actually I just done 14. I, mean, I spent uh, five years sitting with her a couple weekends a month as she saw people and learning from her directly. And then I decided I wanted to uh, explore it more. And so I met Stephen and it's just, you know, I've been going at it full time for 12 years now. And uh, so I came more from the, uh, my family was sick, I was sick and got better side of things. And uh, I've seen herbs do really miraculous uh, wonders and in, in the life of myself and my family and lots of clients. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of background noise and kind of a slight echo. So I don't oh, know if okay. you put your mic a little closer or, or I don't know what's going on in the background, but I can hear a lot of shuffling of things. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, you know, we, we think, a lot of people think of herbal medicine as like primitive, something that, you know, doesn't, but still about 75 to 85% uh, percent of the world's population, all, all of this mainly in developing countries, still relies primarily on herbs. Now, the author of this article says this is primarily because of the general belief that herbal drugs are without any side effects uh, besides being cheap and locally available. I don't really think that's true in most uh you know, third world countries, it's just what's there. It's just available. Um, whereas the the prescription drugs are expensive and inaffordable. Uh, it, that's a, a philosophy that a lot of people in the United States have, which I think is 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 true. Uh, so her, herbal herbal medicines are generally without side effects. So uh, it's only the uh, really uh, strong ones that are very medicinal that do. But anyway, according to the World Health Organization, the use of herbal remedies throughout the world exceeds that of conventional drugs by two to three times. So most people in the world use herbal medicine. Um, traditional medicine, uh, which is what uh, you know, uh, herbal medicine is part of, uh, is the knowledge skill. This is the definition from the World Health Organization: is the knowledge, skills, and practices based on the theories, beliefs, and experiences of, in, of indigenous people in various cultures. Uh, used to, to prevent disease. And in some countries, like the United States, we refer to this as alternative or complementary medicine. However, when you look at it, herbal medicine is the standard. The alternative is, is modern medicine. So what we want to talk about tonight is, are herbs safe? Are herbs effective? We want to talk about her the concept of herbal medicine and wholeness. We want to talk about the financial consideration of why herbs are valuable today the environmental considerations as to why herbs are valuable today and kind of wrap this up with talking about the eclectic approach to health. And I know Thomas calls himself the eclectic herbalist, so he's uh, really uh, big on that. So the first you know, question you know, is we hear in the media a lot of cautions and you read articles that suggest that herbs are dangerous or herbs that you know, you know, can be really hazardous or toxic or blah, 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 blah. And every time I read that stuff, I just, I, I get so frustrated sometimes with it. I just, I just want to pull my hair out. I just like, I can't believe that I'm reading this, this stuff because it is so, the, the, the problems with herbal medicine are so exaggerated that it's ridiculous. And, and to compare it, and especially when you compare it to modern drugs. Um, when you, you do studies of drugs um, to get them approved for use, the studies are generally short-lived. They usually are only done for six to eight weeks. And, uh, and most harmful side effects of drugs show up only after months of use. So they test it for six to eight weeks, no harmful side effects show up, so okay, boom, it's approved, it's safe. You stick it out in the marketplace, and half of all the medications that are FDA approved as being you know, safe and effective and whatever get withdrawn from the uh, uh, marketplace within 10 years due to harmful side effects that show up after the medicines have been introduced. And this is such a serious problem that iatrogenic disease, which is doctor-induced illness, is the sixth leading cause of death. Um, and this is a quote. Uh, from Harper's Magazine was quoted by Stephen Herod Buner in The Lost Language of Plants. He says, on average, 
the number of Zimbabweans killed each week by AIDS is 2,500. The average number of Americans killed each week by prescription drugs is 1,900. So, you know, the medical drugs are just, you know, have a lot of problems. That's part of the reason, you know, why then people who are involved in that mindset and know the problems with prescription drugs, and, and you have to think of it from their perspective, they are so used to this idea that for something to be medicinal, um, it has to have this toxicity, this risks versus benefits ratio. So they're assuming that anything that's got, got the capability of curing disease is going to be like this. So they are extrapolating and, and figuring out that these herbal drugs, quote unquote, or these herbal medications must have a whole bunch of side effects that just aren't getting reported or whatever because they're being, you know, put out by unskilled practitioners. I read some statistics recently um, from uh, uh, Israel and I think the other place was New Zealand. And uh, at, uh, over the last 10 years or so, um, twice in, in these places, there had been doctor's strikes where they shut down all doctor's offices and uh, hospitals except for emergency services, and uh, the death rates plummeted. When, when they took away all of the uh, everything but emergencies, all of the voluntary uh, procedures and things like that, um, you know, the death rates plummeted by 30% or so, and that's that's pretty huge. So I think it you know it kind of shows you that there's a lot of medicine that's great. Modern medicine and emergency medicine is absolutely wonderful, but it's it's grown into such a uh, bloated, wasteful, and dangerous uh, profession many times that it's not surprising to me that more and more people in the industrialized worlds are turning back to natural medicines. Yeah. So to understand how, you know, how we know herbs are safe, how do we know foods are safe? How do you know a carrot is safe to eat? How do you know a potato is safe to eat? How do you know that any of these things are safe to eat? Because there's a concept, and the FDA recognized this, it's called generally recognized as safe. In other words, foods, spices, and other things that have a long history of human beings using them are considered grass, grass or grass generally recognized as safe. But, you know, we've never done scientific studies to prove that potatoes are safe to eat, to prove that carrots are safe to eat. We trust generations of human experience. It says people have eaten this, these foods. They've been passed down from generation to generation. Therefore, we, we figure that they've got to be pretty safe if, if you know, if generation after generation of human beings has been able to eat them. Well, that's the same thing with most you know, medicinal herbs. We have the same thing. We have generations of human beings that have used these plants, that have safely used these plants um, for generations and have, like I say, in some cases, uh, several hundred to a couple of thousand years of recorded history of people using this stuff. So that's, that's the concept of grass. So most herbs are grass, generally recognized as safe. Um, but a lot of what's used to justify the idea that herbs are toxic is because they take a compound out of a plant that, you know, is a quote unquote an active constituent and then they uh, uh, say that, oh, this compound is toxic, therefore the plant is toxic. Well, that is ridiculous from a, a book that was written in the latter part of the last century called The Physiomedical Dispensary, it says this, it is, deeply it is an opinion deeply rooted in the public mind that the qualities and actions of a chemical compound can be derived from a knowledge of its constituents. And, and so it's a very common belief that people have that if you, if you can take out a particular compound out of a, an herb and, that has a particular activity, that from that we can I, you know, derive what the herb is going to do and how toxic it's going to be and all that sort of thing. It just isn't true. And to demonstrate it isn't true, I years back uh, found this article, um, which I kept, called, that, that was entitled, Based on Modern Research, There's One Inescapable Conclusion, The Food You Eat Is Killing You. And this is what he said in this article. Carrots contain a uh, carotoxin of fairly potent nerve poison and my, my a hallucinogenic drug. 
Radishes contain two substances that cause goiters. Broccoli contains five goiter-causing substances. Olives are processed in lye and contain tannins, which have been linked to cancer risk. And olive oil contains low le levels of a cancer-causing agent. Shrimp contain higher levels of arsenic, iodine, and copper than some scientists would consider safe. Potatoes contain solene, an alkaloid which interferes with the transmission of nerve impulses, and in fact, all members of the tomato, the potato family, including tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, contain similar alkaloids. Apples contain phylorosin, which interferes with enzyme systems, and oranges contain the flavoin tangerine, which is toxic to developing embryos and other toxic chemicals, tyramine, synephrine, and citrol. In other words, every food you eat has chemicals that you could take out of the food and isolate them, and they're poisonous. But that doesn't mean that the food is poisonous, because every food contains thousands of chemical compounds, literally thousands of chemical compounds, as does every herb contain literally thousands of chemical compounds. So you have to look at how the whole interacts with the human body, not just at isolated um, compounds. And, f and to further stress this in Physiomedical Dispensary, and this is a book written in the late, like, 1890, says the most irrepressible form of this infatuation assumes is that of attempting to pass judgment on the qualities of organic agents, such as an herb, from a so-called chemical analysis of it. A prominent instance of this kind is found in the fact that chemical fermentation carried on in a certain manner will yield an alcoholic product from corn or carry it on another manner will yield sugar materials, or carry on in still another manner will give a vinegar product. But, but no man of the first grains of intelligence will pretend that either of these three products existed as such in the unfermented corn, as otherwise the meal of this grain might be used indiscriminately to preserve pickles, to sweeten coffee, or to get drunk upon. So in other words, when you take something apart, automatically in the process of taking it apart, you've altered it. Um, and when you undergo some kind of, uh, you know, analysis or, or whatever, you're, you're changing the substance in, in the very process of, of analyzing it. So really, the, a lot of the, the uh, dangers that you read about with herbs are all hypothetical dangers based on risks of individual compounds that are present in the plants, not actually on any evidence whatsoever of the actual historical use of the plant having those problems. And this is a, a, a thing that uh, really bugs me too, is when the media says that, you know, the herbal industry isn't really very well regulated. Well, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. FDA has the complete power to remove any unsafe product from the market uh, place and has recently put in place very stringent you know manufacturing guidelines for all you know herb and supplement companies that involve tracking raw materials keeping records data blah 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 safety inspections so on and so forth and so the the industry is actually very highly regulated and considering the fact that the FDA you know has the power to to remove uh, stuff from the marketplace. They have removed things from the marketplace. And they've, they, in some cases, they've removed herbs from the marketplace based on very, very flimsy evidence. With, with all the problems with iatrogenic disease and drugs, it's interesting that the uh, poison control centers, which handle cases of toxicity from ingesting plants and everything, and, and, and the, the, you know, the, the agencies that report adverse effects have almost zero okay, reports of adverse effects from any of your you know, commercially available herbs or uh, vitamin and mineral supplements. So it, it, it's, it's really ridiculous. In fact, um, Sam Hill Thompson uh, in the early 1800s said that doctors hold herbalists to a higher, higher level, higher standard than they hold themselves. And it's true, then here's why. Herbal remedies are not considered to have any benefit in the eyes of the regulatory agencies. A drug is, is looked at as having a 
risk versus a benefit ratio. In other words, all drugs are consi you know, considered to have some toxic effects, and, uh, and if the benefits of the drug outweigh the risks of the toxic effect, then it's considered to be a safe drug. It's not that it doesn't have toxic effects or it doesn't have uh, uh, side effects. It's that the idea is that the benefits outweigh the risk. Since herbs are not considered to have any benefit, any negative reaction to an herb becomes justification to take it off the market, even if it really actually ha would have a really good risk versus benefit ratio. And I can give you a specific example of this. Um, due to the, um, the misuse of uh, Chinese ephedra, or ma huang, by uh, herbal supplement manufacturers who used it as a weight loss aid and uh, pushed people to take you know, uh, fairly high doses of it to jack up their metabolism, which is a way it was never used in traditional Chinese medicine or never used in the herbal tradition. Um, and based on 110 approximately, it was just a little over 100, might have been 120, um, adverse reports of a federal related deaths. Now, uh, uh, when it says a federal related death, that doesn't mean that it was proven that the ephedra caused the death. It was that a person died in an automobile accident and they had ephedra uh, in their glove compartment or they, an athlete died and you know, they, they had ephedra in their locker and, or, or they had. Now, some of those cases actually were people who were really misusing ephedra. They were taking way higher doses than you know, could be recommended. So using that, the regulatory agents removed this wonderful herb from the marketplace, even though, and here's, here's the, the glitch of the whole thing that, that frosts your cookies, even though the alkaloids from ephedra that are supposed to be toxic are, are basically isolated and synthetically produced as drugs in over-the-counter cold medications. And all of the ephedra products that they took off the marketplace had lower levels of ephedrine alkaloids in them than over-the-counter cold medications that you could buy at the drugstore. That's the double standard. Herbs are held to a higher standard of safety than our drugs. Bottom line. So you can rest assured that if any company you know, puts out, you know, a botanical that's toxic and people start getting any adverse effects, it's only going to take a few reports of adverse effects and FDA is going to jerk that product off the marketplace. But most herbs that we have are, are even generally recognized as safe by the FDA itself. Their, their complaint about regulation is that people are using them to cure disease and, and they're, you know, the product companies who are manufacturing the products and the the health food stores and places that are selling the products aren't supposed to make disease claims for these products because they're not approved for disease claims, and that's the regulatory thing they're talking about, is they don't want people to be able to you know, buy these things and use them as medicine. But, but it's not because the herbs are unsafe. Thomas, did you want to add anything to that, my little ranting there? <laughs> No, I, I would I would just say that you know one of the the arguments uh, against herbs is quite frequently well we just don't know how they work at least I, I hear that from some of my medical friends and I have to uh, agree with them that you know there are maybe fifteen herbs that we really uh, understand the mechanism of action uh, behind it. And that's not a lot, but you also have to look at pharmaceuticals, and about half of the Merck manual has a, a you know written underneath the drug unknown mechanism of action. And so, you know, this is one of those where once again, I think that it, they're trying to hold herbs to, or at least the medical profession is trying to hold herbs to a higher standard than the own pharmaceuticals which they regularly use. Yeah, so the, the, the safety issue becomes, you know, people are, are you're, you're used to eating certain foods, so you assume they're safe. I mean, people are taking, there are people are smoking, people drinking alcohol, people smoking pot, doing all kinds of stuff. And a lot of, you know, botanical remedies are far safer than a lot of those behaviors, 
or even eating um, junk food, in my opinion, is probably more risky than taking most herbs. Now, that's not to say that there aren't plants that are toxic. I mean, there are some people who go, you know, get the idea, it's from nature, so it can't hurt you. Well, they're ignoring the fact that there are toxic botanicals. There are plants that are, um, that are poisonous, you know. So what we teach in, in our School of Modern Medicine is this model of the four degrees of action. And basically at the center where it's green, we have the foods, the things that we eat for calories, for fats, proteins, carbohydrates. We consume them in large quantities, you know, very regularly. All foods have some medicinal action. They have some, you know, benefits in terms of helping to uh, the body to maintain itself and or even heal itself. Beyond that, we have substances we use regularly um, in, in food, what I call medicinal foods. We don't eat them in large quantities, but, you know, we, we, they're, they're obviously pretty safe. You know, like I would sit down and could eat a couple oranges, but most people are not going to sit down and eat a bunch of lemons. Uh, but we use lemon juice in, in various recipes or to make lemonade. Uh, we might eat, use quite a bit of onion in a dish, but we're going to use a lot less of garlic because garlic is so much stronger. But that doesn't mean that garlic isn't safe to be consumed on a regular basis. Um, and uh, so all, most of our kitchen spices would fall into that category of being medicinal foods. In other words, things that, that have the potential to help heal the body, they're stronger, they're used in smaller quantities, but they still have a very wide margin of safety because, you know, people use them and eat them all the time. The third degree is medicines. Now, medicines is basically um, uh, anything that is non-toxic, meaning you can use it safely, has a high degree of safety, <coughs> but you would never eat it as food. And I'm talking about things like Cascara Sagrada and Lobelia and Golden Seal and, and all of what we consider our medicinal herbs, which have really a, a very, you know, wide margin of safety. Um, but, you know, we just, we just don't eat them. We use them only when we're, we're sick or the body's out of balance. We're trying to bring it back into balance. And then when the body's really out of balance, we have things that, you know, can make drastic changes in the body, which are, are toxic botanicals or what we could call drugs. Um, and most drugs are, de are derived from toxic botanicals. When we talk about the, those medicines that are derived from drugs, they're drugs derived from toxic poisonous plants. So uh, modern medicine tends to go first to fourth degree remedies. Uh, occasionally a few third degree remedies, but a lot of what they do is third and fourth degree remedies. Where in herbal medicine, you know, we tend to focus on first, second, third degree remedies and occasionally we'll use a toxic botanical in, in very low dose to kind of bring the body back into balance. So, you know, there, there are plants that are poisonous, but I can guarantee this, that uh, none of the major herb companies are going to put out any of the toxic botanicals to the general public because they've got liability issues of they could get sued. And so they're going to err on the side of caution in using remedies that, you know, have a history of safety because they don't want to get sued. And unfortunately, that means that we have, you know, some botanicals that actually are very valuable and safe when used properly occasionally become hard to find because the insurance costs and make it difficult for companies to carry them. So let's go now to the uh, uh, next thing, are herbs effective? Now, this is an argument I hear a lot from people, okay, well, you know, it's safe, you can use it, but, but anything that's like that mild, like for example, I've, I read in Vero Tyler's The Honest Herbal, that dandelion is, you know, pretty inert, that it really doesn't have much medicinal quality. Well, that's kind of a, an assumption uh, that goes along with the, the pharmaceutical mindset that if it doesn't have toxic qualities, that it couldn't possibly heal the body. And that's, uh, and that's again, not true. 
this is something I've said for years. This is this is why I one of the reasons why I'm into herbal medicine. Which one do you have more confidence in? Uh, a a uh, research from uh, on drugs, which is usually funded by companies that have a vested interest in getting those drugs into the marketplace, where they do those little short-term studies for six to eight weeks to take some compound that's never been found in nature and never been used by human beings and test it first in animal models and then in human models and then decide it's safe and then stick it in the marketplace and half of them gets withdrawn in 10 years? Or do you have more faith where in hundreds and maybe even thousands of years of human beings recording their experience that they've used this you know, in a certain way and it's worked and it's been effective? I personally have more faith in the latter, which is why I eat food. <laughs> because, because obviously I'm trusting when I'm eating the, the various you know, fruits and vegetables and grains and legumes and things that we've assumed to be safe is that, that human beings over the years uh, of, of generations have been uh, you know, sensible. <laughs> that, that human beings you know, tend to figure out rather rapidly when something works or something doesn't work. And when generation after generation says something works and it's, and it's safe and whatever, that I trust that. I have, a lot of, I have a lot more confidence in that than I do in the quote-unquote scientific study that was done to prove that a, a drug or a, or a substance was effective. And you, you can get into looking at issues like aspartame, which um, when aspartame was approved, it's very interesting that all the studies done by the FDA and the pharmaceutical companies all said aspartame was safe, and all the studies done by completely independent laboratories all said it had serious, dangerous problems. So that there, there's an issue in in science that you know research gets twisted in order to match who's funding it, and that's actually a, a well-known maxim of science. And by the way, I just to be fair, that also applies to the herb industry as well, <laughs> because because Whenever we have a vested interest in selling something, we tend to distort the facts in our favor. And Thomas, I know you want, you want I could hear you chomping yeah, at you, you beat things. me to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I have people um, every week that send me the new greatest product with the 43 studies to back it up. And I look at the studies, uh, the one in particular I looked at last week. I looked at the, the studies that they sent along uh, with their product information and absolutely none of the studies were done on their product. They were done on isolated compounds found in their product. They were done uh, in different, you know, like they were done on injections and this was an ingestion product. It was, so, you know, we knock pharmaceutical companies for for their research issues, but I feel like that the the nutraceutical companies are becoming almost as bad as that, and I think that we have a responsibility as herbalists and consumers of these wonderful natural things to to say, hey, you don't have to use uh, crap science to sell your product. Just you know, show me where it's traditional. Show me where it's had a human study. Show me that it works. Show me some testimonials and that it's safe. And uh, and I'll give it a try. I don't think that we need to to rely so much on uh, flashy scientific numbers that really don't have any value to sell natural things. Amen, brother. In fact, uh, I really love this. Uh, the book Man the Unknown by Alexis Carroll, who was the medical doctor who performed the first kidney transplant. And in it, he said about science, he said, important facts may be completely ignored. Our mind has the natural tendency to reject the things that do not fit into the frame of the scientific or philosophical beliefs of our time. After all, scientists are only men. They are saturated with the prejudices of their environment and of the epic. They willingly believe that Facts that cannot be explained by current theories do not exist. Evident facts have having an unorthodox appearance are suppressed. So, you know, while science is great and I I enjoy, you know, learning stuff from science, I, I also recognize that science is limited. 
It's, it's one way of looking at it. And you can, when you combine science and you look also at tradition and you look at other, other factors, you get a much better picture of what's really going on. So Thomas, why don't you pitch in here and talk a little bit about, okay, so how do you find reliable information about, you know, herbs? And yeah, so separate, separating the garbage from the, the hype from the, the, the true stuff. So everybody is going to um, run any, anything that they encounter in their world through their own set of filters. And I think it's very important that we understand our own bias when we're evaluating life in general, including herbs. Um, I personally have a, kind of created my own little internal uh, weighted value system, if you will, when uh, it, it comes to herbs. And uh, the thing that I value first at the top of my list above anything else is uh, uh, its historical usages and uh, you know what group of people used them for use that plant for what problem uh, and what did they not use it for and uh, beneath the uh, so that would be like number one number two would be um, would be uh, clinical experience so if the if the plan is relatively you know recently discovered and there are a handful that are like that or if it's a uh, a uh, uh, different part of the plant than has been traditionally used and there's not a lot of historical information written about it, then do the people that I value their opinion, the professional herbalist that, uh, you know, are, are in the field seeing the clients and, you know, writing about their experiences, what do they have to say about it? Uh, thirdly, I look at the research done on it um, because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, only about 15 herbs, we know the extent of their mechanism of action. There's a lot of a, a, a large number of herbs that have proposed mechanisms of actions and we, we know that they act in some way on this part of the body, but we aren't sure exactly how. And so because I value tradition and uh, clinical experience over um, what passes for research and science nowadays, uh, I, I kind of place that uh, down in the third area very closely um, related to kind of the fourth way of knowing which is uh, intuition, uh, my personal intuition and the intuition of uh, um, mentors and, and colleagues that I value their, their intuition on the subject. And so yeah, when you're looking for research on herbs, um, don't expect to find extensive research. Don't expect to find large studies uh, like you will with pharmaceuticals. You have to understand that to perform large studies, you need large amounts of money. And uh, you know why would you do a thousand-person study on the diuretic usage of dandelion leaf when everybody could go in their backyard and pick dandelion leaf, and you wouldn't make any money off the product that you were selling? So. Understand that you're not going to find the same amount of research, but what you will find is a plant that has a long history of safe usage with uh, some proposed mechanisms of actions and uh, lots of written usages and, and clinical experience. And to me, that is enough to justify uh, trying an herbal myself or a client. Yeah, when I find good historical literature, or uh, gain insights from one of the, the practitioners who I consider to be a good practitioner, one who, who is observant of how things affect their clients, such as, such as Thomas is, or Matthew Wood, um, or David Winston. Uh, I value that and, because then that makes me willing to try it because people who've actually used this stuff know better than people who are just researching in books um, and don't, you know, I, I have people go online and they look up things like on WebMD and other places like that, and most of those people are not herbalists. They don't know what they're talking about, you know. They're just pulling stuff out of there and it's not really reliable information on how to use herbs. Yeah, and I, I would also say that when you're finding people to get reliable information from, like if you go to Amazon and just uh, Google um, herb books, 
you'll pull up probably 15,000 herb books of which 14,100 of them are useless and out of that 900 remaining there's maybe you know a good 50 to 100 jewels in there um, but a lot of even the herb books now are written by people that are are what Matthew Wood jokingly refers to as armchair herbalist. You know, they they don't see clients. They only do research and then regurgitate that information into a new form. And so, you have to make sure that the people that you're looking for for herbal information are actually using what they're talking about and have a, a practice and see clients and have experience instead of you know just sit around and reading everybody else's research and coming up with a different way to say it. Yeah, and also I want to mention, trying to match an herb to a medical diagnosis is a really, really ineffective way to use herbs. And I, I, the, and I say this over and over and over again, and people still say, you know, like, okay, what do you use for this health problem? Or what do you use to substitute for this drug? And I, I'm sorry, herbs just don't work that way. Um, the best way to learn to use herbs is to learn to use traditional methods of assessment that were developed to match the remedies. You know, so in in Chinese medicine, in Ayurvedic medicine, in Native American medicine, in traditional Western medicine, they 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 developed ways of assessing what's going on in the body based on how herbs work, not based on the modern medical model. And so I know everybody is you know is used to thinking in terms of the modern medical model but when you know I've I've taken a number of people that have come to see me and they've had you know medical doctor can't tell them what's wrong or whatever and I use traditional systems of assessment figure out exactly how their systems out of balance and what remedies to give them and they get well the um, medical diagnosis is a very poor basis on which to use herbs and and when the herbal renaissance was getting started I mean most of the literature out there is historical uses, a list of diseases and herbs, you know, to use them for without really understanding the, the, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with the herbs. And, and also, um, herbs are not magic bullets. Unlike, you know, they're, again, they're not drugs. You're not isolated single chemical compounds. They're, they usually work on broad underlying biological processes to restore the body to normal function. So it's not, uh, you know, about, you know, trying to just specifically treat the disease. And here, now, now there are herbs when you get into fourth degree botanicals, okay, um, you get into some pretty, you can get into some pretty drug-like herbs. Um, you know, things that actually kill pain or reduce blood pressure or slow the heart rate or, or whatever. Um, and medical doctors used to use herbs like these, like opium and foxglove before the advent of modern medicine. Um, and, and then they learned to extract out the, the quote-unquote active compounds out of these things and concentrate them. So instead of using foxglove, they now use digitalis, which is an alkaloid from, you know, the foxglove. Or they use, you know, the, the heroin or other uh, uh, alkaloids from the opium poppy. But that's because um, while there are herbs that have fast-acting effects, that's really not the best approach to getting well. In, in traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, the drug-like herbs are considered to be inferior medicines because they're basically symptom relievers, okay? They're symptom relievers. That's all they're doing. They're not restoring the body to normal function. And that's another issue as to why I think herbal medicine is necessary in the modern world, not just herbs. But herbal medicine, the whole construct of understanding that you get in traditional medicine is about balancing out the body, not about just relieving the symptoms of disease. In, in TCM, a superior medicine is a slow-acting tonic that gradually restores the body uh, uh, to health. So um, I, I think, you know, I... The, this is what I look for. I'm I'm not interested in just something that's going to be fast acting, symptom relieving. I really want something that's going to help me get well, and I and that's where the a lot of the medicinal herbs and dietary changes come in. So the next topic we're going to talk about is herbal medicine and wholeness, and 
I, I love this saying. It's an old Zen saying, when a man is young and knows nothing, trees are trees, mountains are mountains, and waters are waters. But when he has studied and knows a little, trees are no longer trees, mountains are no longer mountains, and waters are no longer waters. But when he f has thoroughly studied and finally understands, trees are once again trees, mountains are mountains, and waters are waters. Thomas was saying there's only a handful of remedies that we you know, know the mechanisms of action for. I would like to ask how many of you can explain how your computer works, or explain how your TV set works, or explain how your cell phone works. You don't know. Most, most 99% of the population doesn't even have a rudimentary idea how a computer works. But, they could, but, but you get preschoolers turning it on and doing things on the computer. And so there's a level of complexity where you know you look in and you're trying to understand what's going on behind the scenes and so forth, but there's also a level of simplicity that you turn it on and it works. And once you get past your fears and you start experimenting with herbs, you start understanding this level of simplicity. Okay, you don't exactly know how or why it does what it does, but you understand pretty well what it does. Uh, I mean, a, you know, very straightforward example of that is remember. Uh, uh, a nature Sunshine Manager named Frank Misi saying, you know, he, when he was first learning about herbs, he learned, oh, cascara scrata makes you go to the bathroom. Okay, <laughs> boom, I got that one down. All right, um, cayenne pepper stimulates circulation. You, the, the, and, and you can actually, when you start playing with herbs and using them, you can actually feel and experience those effects in your body and start to understand them on how they apply to helping to balance out your system and get well. But you don't have to understand exactly why or how or what's going on in the body that makes it work. You just know that it works. That's it. Um, obviously, though, you know, food is your best medicine. Let you know, food be your medicine, your medicine be your food, said Hippocrates. I mean, healing really needs to start with diet. But one thing I want to to discuss is this idea that there's a gradient between food and medicine. There is no specific place where you can kind of say, oh, here's where food ends and here's where medicine begins. And I've used the same colors that uh, on this chart that I used on the four degrees of action because it's really the same model, just spelled out in a little different way of, of looking at it. Uh, on the food end of the spectrum, you've got plants, substances that contain large amounts of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, fiber, what we think of as macronutrients or our major nutrients, and smaller amounts of phytochemicals. Now remember that every food contains phytochemicals. Potatoes contain small amounts of tannins. They contain small amounts of alkaloids like solanine. Uh, every food contains these phytochemicals, uh, essential oils, uh, saponins, glycosides, etc. It's just in food substances, they're, they're in a little bit smaller amounts, and the macronutrients are there in larger amounts. As you move into the idea of, of the medicinal foods, the spices, you get more of those phytochemicals and a little less of the nutritive stuff. And as you move into medicinal plants, you're getting a lot stronger phytochemical reaction, a lot less nutritive action. And then when you're moving over to the full medicine toxic botanical side, the strength of the phytochemicals is, is overpowering compared to a lot of the nutritive qualities of that plant. So it's a gradient really. Um, and the farther your body is out of balance, the more you can reach out into the medicine end of the spectrum to, to try to nudge the body back to balance. But obviously, it's on the food and the medicinal food end of the spectrum that you want to um, do this. So Samuel Thompson said, I shall now describe the fuel which continues the fire or life of man. This is contained in two things, food and medicines, by which he meant herbs which are in harmony with each other. 
often grow in the same field to be used by the same people. People who are capable of raising their food and preparing the same may as easily learn to collect and prepare all their medicines and administer the same as needed. Always, always like that quote. I don't know if any of you have read uh, the work of Masanobu Fukuoka, The One Straw Revolution, the farmer who developed permaculture, but he uh, would just basically throw his vegetable seeds and let them grow in with the weeds and basically not try to, to, to cultivate them. And he said, edible herbs and wild vegetables, plants growing on the mountain and in the meadow, are very high in nutritional value and are also useful as medicine. Food and medicine are not two different things. They are the front and back of one body. Chemically grown vegetables may not may be eaten for food, but they cannot be used as medicine. Why? Because the, the foods that are growing in kind of the semi-wild manner that Masanobu Fukuoka is talking about contain higher levels of these phytochemicals. And I believe that these phytochemicals, in the small amounts that they would be found in natural wild foods and herbs, are actually needed by the body as nutrients. This is a theory I've had for a long, long time. So when we're eating a bunch of refined, processed, bland food that's missing these kind of phytochemicals, that's why medicinal herbs become healing. Many of the plants that we use as medicinal herbs were eaten like wild vegetables, such as dandelion or burdock or um, or, or saw palmetto berries or so forth. In, in fact, you know, bilberries are just basically blueberries. And he continues saying, vegetables that are biologically closest to their wild ancestors are the best in flavor because flavor is also a function of the phytochemicals beyond the macronutrients and the highest in food value. Foods that have departed far from their wild state and those raised chemically or in a completely contrived environment unbalance the body's chemistry. The more out of balance one's body becomes, the more one uh, comes to desire unnatural foods, and this situation is dangerous to health. So I actually believe that herbal medicine is an extension of nutrition up to the point that you start dealing with toxic botanicals. You're, you're basically ingesting plants with higher levels of phytochemicals to try to rebalance the body that's been unbalanced by eating food that's deficient in those same phytochemicals. Thomas, do you have any comments you want to make on that thought? No, I'm just, no, I'm, I'm going to sit over here in the cheerleading section. That's <laughs> exact. Great, thank you. Okay, so I put this little chart together because I think a lot of people are, are, are you know, kind of, this is how I see it, and, and I know a lot of people don't quite see it this way, um, so I'm going to explain it. I have here on down the side, food, medicine, drug. That's basically the gradient, you know, from going from from food to toxic botanical to drug, okay? And then I have whole part and synthetic. Okay, so ideally, the the bulk of what we're looking for is whole, minimally processed natural foods and natural herbs and spices, things that are whole, that have this complexity, that that... I believe, um, in fact, when I first got started studying herbs after you know my experience, I kind of was looking at it from the standpoint of outdoor survival. And it was a couple of years later when this idea dawned on me that maybe God had made it perfect in the first place and man's attempt to isolate and extract out the quote-unquote active in constituents actually made it less effective. And I actually started to make the shift to trying to use herbs and, and whole foods and so forth to heal myself, which actually did work. Now, when you take a food and you extract out those macronutrients, so you, you take whole wheat and you make refined white flour, or you take whole sugar cane and you make white sugar, or you take whole corn and you make cornstarch, or you take a whole natural oily plant and you not only press out the oil but then you process the oil and, and refine it, you're basically extracting part of the food out of the context of its wholeness. And we say that that is that we have denatured is one word we have for that. In other words we have we've removed the 
the, that nutrition, nutritional substance from its natural state, so we have denatured it. Another term is we have devitalized it. And this is because I, um, I believe that it isn't just the chemistry of the plant that's healing, it's the energy of the plant that's healing. Life is energy. And the whole is held together in a complex biological, it, it, it's a, it's a li uh, living food is an energetic being that has a whole energy process to it. My first herb teacher talked about how plants capture the light energy of the sun and use it to basically raise the vibration of the non-living elements of the earth and charge them with life. But when you take and you devitalize a food, you're returning it back to a chemical nature and away from a living whole. And we know, if any of us who have been involved in natural healing, that this stuff isn't as good for our bodies. I mean, yes, you can, sur you can survive on it for a while, but it imbalances your body chemistry. Now, so... I've always been suspicious, and this is just my personal opinion, and Thomas, I'll let you throw in your thing on it, of, of excessive use of most vitamin and mineral supplements, because most vitamin and mineral supplements are basically synthetic substances. They, some of them are derived from cornstarch or other natural compounds, but they're synthetically created. Um, all your B vitamins, all your C vitamins are all synthesized. That's because because since they are destroyed by water, they're destroyed by heat, and they're destroyed by light, any process that you would try to take and, and refine a food to extract out water-soluble vitamins, you would destroy them in the process. So basically all water-soluble vitamins are chemically derived. Now there are some foods that are rich in water-soluble water vitamins, such as you know rose hips have a lot of vitamin C and and acerola cherries have a lot of vitamin C, and brewer's yeast has a lot of B vitamins. Uh, and there are some natural uh, concentrated foods that have a lot of fat-soluble vitamins in them, like, like uh, grass-fed butter or, uh, or the cod liver oil. But, but most of the supplements are synthetic compounds where you're duplicating a chemical compound out of a food and you're taking it out of context of the whole. So yes, while I do use some vitamin and mineral supplements, um, uh, particularly vitamin D3 because we don't get it enough in our environment and so forth, I, I really try to go as much as possible to the whole natural foods. And if there's a way to get it from food, I'd rather try to get it from food. Okay, Thomas, you want to pitch in with your yeah I, two cents worth on that? Um, yeah, I, I use vitamin sure. I use vitamins and minerals um, uh, with my clients, but I try to do as much food as I can. And and kind of my purpose uh, when I do use synthetic vitamins and minerals is uh, that. I'm going to use them long enough to bring the body back in balance and get the person feeling better so that they'll have the energy to do the dietary stuff that they need to maintain that level of health. And so, yeah, I, I treat vitamins uh, and, uh, and supplements like I would a third or fourth degree herb, you know, which used uh, for a short time period to bring somebody back in balance and then you use the the food based remedies to maintain and continue to improve their health but i have seen people who imbalance their body chemistry because they they took way too many synthetic vitamins and minerals Be, because they they would take like yeah. uh, a vitamin mineral supplement and then they take a they take something like the nature sunshine nutricom which is a b complex and c vitamin supplement on top of that and then the nature sunshine mega kel which is loaded with vitamins and they'd be having all these health problems because they're basically taking five or six different supplements all loaded with with synthetic vitamins and minerals to the point that they're getting very high levels of that and your liver and kidneys are having to process all that and when yeah. i got them off that they felt better yeah, I, I've seen that, and and what I see more frequently than that is people that you know they'll they'll pay the money for a really high quality multivitamin, 
And instead of using it to boost their levels and uh, get back to a healthy diet, they say, oh, well, you know, I'm getting what I need through this pill, so let me go have some more Twinkies and Ho-Hos. And, and so that's one of the bigger problems that I see also. Is well, right. That, using it as an excuse to continue the same unhealthy uh, choices that got them into the mess in the first place. And what about all the other thousands of phytochemicals that are in the whole food? Right, that we, absolutely. That we, that and, we don't and, even know about yet, right? And, 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 and you know, they're the craze for the, well, I guess it's been a while now, five or ten years probably, is to do these... Uh, um, powdered whole food greens and fruits and vegetables. And while I don't think there's an, anything inherently evil about those, I'd much prefer somebody sit down and eat a big salad than I would them take a you know, powdered supplement. I, I, I think the body will utilize food best, and you have to let the body know, hey, you're getting, you, you've got to get what you need from this food. I'm not going to be you know, jacking up on all of this supplemental stuff. Yeah, when I talk about uh, someone says synthetic mineral, I'm talking about synth the, the the synthetic mineral supplements. Basically, most mineral supplements are are various um, minerals that are bound to various uh, organic molecules. Some of which are easier to break down in the digestive tract and assimilate than others, but they're not again being derived from food. I mean, the way minerals are presented to you in food is they're presented bound up into organic molecules like uh, for example uh, hemoglobin with iron at the center of it or chlorophyll with magnesium at the center of it and actually the body assimilates that much much more efficiently with a lot less gastrointestinal irritation than it does a, um, a, uh, uh, a vitamin mineral supplement. Now, now let's shift down to the next column, medicine. Okay, just a, a real, yeah. a real easy. A, Go ahead. I, yeah. I was going to say a real easy way to to think about that is to uh, think that plants eat rocks, minerals, and we eat plants, but we don't eat rocks. You know, so the whole concept of uh, of calcium carbonate, seashell calcium, and coral calcium, and all of these things that we would never sit down and munch on. Those are what, they're, they're not technically synthetic, but they're not naturally uh, ingested either. So I think that's kind of what we're talking about when we say synthetic mineral supplements. Right. Well, and, and Mark, Mark Pedersen, um, who uh, was in, in one of the people in research and development in Nature Sunshine Products, um, basically helped, you know, educated me about a lot of this stuff. Uh, there's only four or five companies in the world that make vitamin, vitamin and mineral supplements, and everybody buys from those manufacturers. There's different grades or different qualities because you can make vitamin C from coal tar and you can make it from cornstarch, but they're all synthetic. You, you cannot extract them from food. So the only way to get nat totally natural vitamins is from foods. You can't really take them in a pill. Um, there's different grades, and, and there's some you know forms of minerals that are better than others, and so you know you can get higher quality uh, nutrients. But basically, they're they're all they're all and they're isolated. Again, it's like it's to me it's like refined sugar or white flour. You're taking the food out of the context of the whole, and while you may need to do that temporarily to get your bio biochemistry back in balance, I don't think it's the long-term solution to staying healthy. Now, if you take non-toxic medicinal herbs and herbal extracts, you're still, you know, like talking about like a tea or or a or a glycerite or something. You've got a, a a whole remedy, okay? But then what's happening a lot is following the model of the pharmaceutical company. Increasingly, we're we're getting into this nutraceutical era, where instead of using the whole non non-toxic herb or herbal extract. They're standardizing the extracts, which often involves using uh, chemicals, various chemicals, to basically isolate and concentrate specific compounds from the plants. Now, that gives it a more drug-like action. It's, it's, it, it becomes more like the drug. It's a devitalized herb. Um, 
a denatured herb. Not that this stuff isn't valuable sometimes, and not that nutraceuticals aren't valuable. I misspelled nutraceuticals. It's, it got an A in it. But a nutraceutical, basically, there's phytochemicals. That's the chemicals found in the plants. And then there's nutraceuticals, which are things like SAMe and alpha-lipoic acid and so forth that are natural compounds that may be present in, in either in animal tissue or in human tissue that are basically, you know, they're natural substances, but again, they're being used in isolation. And I do use some of these, and I know, Thomas, you use some of them, but I consider them more to be a, a stronger form of medicine, again, for bringing the body back into balance, and not as good at actually healing the body as whole ho foods and whole herbs. And then, of course, you can get the same compounds synthetically duplicated, such as, you know, for example, progesterone used to be, uh, uh, I mean, progesterone is basically synthetically manufactured from uh, uh, a compounds in corn or wild yam or, or so forth. Or, and now digitalis is not extracted from foxglove like it used to be. It's actually synthetically manufactured. So, Thomas, again, you want to throw in your two cents on that part? Yeah, um, so the standardized extracts, I think, have their, have their place, but the problem is uh, deciding what you're going to standardize. And I'll give you a, a recently published example, it just came out a couple weeks ago, is um, everybody has heard of curcumin, uh, which is a compound in turmeric that's anti-inflammatory and really good for you. Uh, well, they, uh, they took all of their curcumin out of turmeric and then gave a curcumin-free turmeric uh, to uh, a sample study, and it still reduced inflammation. So maybe curcumin is not the primary compound in turmeric that they reduced it to, and yet many standardized products are standardized to the curcumin levels, or they're just straight uh, curcumin. And maybe it's the other, you know, curcuminoids in there that are creating some of the actions. So that's one of the issues with standardized products is that the compounds that are chosen to be standardized might not be the correct ones. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's this issue of the whole. You know, and, and so it's actually been a little frustrating to me to watch a lot of the industry moving towards standardized extracts and, and nutraceuticals and all this other stuff and away from, you know, the herbs. Um, now, uh, now, toxic botanicals, we mentioned toxic botanicals. I would still rather use a toxic botanical than a drug. Um, for for one simple reason, that to me, even a toxic botanical, which is a form of botanical drug, is compatible with the human biochemistry. In other words, it is a compound that has been found in nature, has has probably had you know, some history of human use, at least as medicine, um, and if you know how to dose it safety, the body knows how to get rid of it. Whereas, and, and then of course, like I said, certain drugs are basically get isolated as chemicals from toxic botanicals, um, like digitalis, for example. Uh, and then you have synthetic drugs, which, have, which are compounds that have never been found in nature. They're completely unnatural. No, they're, they're, they're totally novel. And that's the stuff that, that, that to me, I, I want to stay away from as much as I possibly can. Um, so it's a gradient, you know. I, I think everything has value in its proper place, but the thing is, is I think the closer you can stay towards the whole and towards the food for healing, the more balanced your body biochemistry will be and the healthier you will be. Um, and uh, someone said, well, what about essential oils? Well, essential oils are a form of uh, a standardized extract. They're, a, they're, a, they're a extracting one of the compounds out of a plant, and basically uh, there's still a, a whole, wholeness to the oil itself, but essential oils move down the level into high third degree and uh, sometimes into fourth degree remedies when used internally. Um, so again, it, it's a gradient, and uh, part of the reason I wanted to teach this is because I, I get tired of people thinking that curcumin is turmeric, you know, <laughs> or or that because or that curcumin is automatically better than turmeric. 
do you want to add anything before we change the slide, Tom? This is kind of a, a, a you know, a pop, pop, big thing I just really wanted to cover. Yeah, no, I'm I'm with you. You know, I with the whole essential oil thing, I'd much rather have a cup of peppermint tea than I would have a dose of peppermint oil. You know, I I think that the whole plant, uh, in almost every circumstance, is more desirable. And as far as standardization, you can somewhat standardize uh, your your whole plants by the extraction method that you're using. You know, if you put a teaspoon of a peppermint leaf in a cup and uh, every night you're drinking a teaspoonful, you're going to be getting about the same level of constituents, assuming that the plant, you know, is, is grown in uh, a similar place and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm a, a much bigger advocate of uh, uh, of, of food-based medicine and whole food herbs than I am standardized extracts. Although, you know, we're going to talk about the eclectic approach in a minute, and uh, I, I do believe in using anything that works, and that does include standardized extracts and recommending people go take synthetic drugs uh, sometimes. And, and even drugs sometimes, absolutely. Someone mentioned a thing I just wanted before I leave off this. How does how does uh, vitamin C work if it's synthetic? Because it's a chemical. It's the same chemical as found in plants. The difference is well, actually, the, the the vitamin C that that we use that you'd find commercially is only the tail end of the naturally occurring vitamin C compound, which is why when you take a synthetically derived vitamin C, you need about a hundred milligrams to get the same effect as ten milligrams from plants. Yeah, and that's actually one of the issues is that you do wind up needing a whole lot higher amounts of vitamins that are basically isolated compounds than you do vitamins that are attached into the whole of the food because the body utilizes things in conjunction with other nutrients. And so the whole always works better than the part in terms of maintaining good health. The part can be used to nudge the body back into balance when it's way out of balance, just like I'm even in favor of using a synthetic drug if the body's far enough out of balance. You know, I mean, obviously there's some stuff that the medical doctors do really well in saving lives of people who are, you know, nearly dead by using drugs to, you know, stabilize their heart rate, their blood pressure, all this other stuff, which is all great. But ultimately to get back to health and wholeness, you have to work more towards the whole food end of the spectrum rather than the synthetic end of the spectrum. So let's uh, uh, briefly talk about you know, the financial aspect of this. I mean, herbal medicine is actually really cost effective. I, I read that saw palmetto actually uh, works as well in studies and, and well, actually, uh, there are certain herbs that work as well as certain drugs in, in, in various studies. Sao Palmetto works as well as a, a drug study. But the cost per pill is just much, much lower because uh, well, you know, a lot of the drug cost is actually marketing and paying out, and paying out all of the claims on when the drugs don't work. Um, in fact, I read that the, uh, half the cost of all drugs is marketing. Um, uh, and a lot large, another large part of it is research. Uh, so, generally speaking, you know, it's herbs are cheaper. So it's the, you know, again, it's a cost-effective thing. Not just that it's good for your health; it's also good for your pocketbook. The reason why it doesn't come across as good for your pocketbook for some people is because a lot of people have insurance and or you know or or their Medicare or something like that, and the government underwrites the drugs. They don't underwrite the herbs, which is a shame, you know, because uh, it would save a lot on the national health care bill if people were, if the government was underwriting the cost of the herbs instead of underwriting the cost of the drugs, or the insurance companies were underwriting the cost of the herbs instead of the drugs. But but ultimately, the cost is low. And let's face it, I, you know, I've heard people, you know, like the FEA threatening to take herbs away, and I say, nobody's ever going to take my herbs away. I uh, last spring I I I wanted to host a little herb walk, and I uh, 
looking around my yard and my property and and walking down the road a little bit and just going to a couple of locations within uh, a mile of where I live, I identified 77 medicinal plants. Some of them I was growing in my garden, which by the way, that's a shot of some of the plants, herbs growing in my own garden, uh, or <laughs> growing out as weeds or, or whatever. Uh, so herbal medicine can be completely free if you're willing to take a little effort to learn how to identify plants and how to make the stuff. Um, there's also something that a lot of people don't think about, which is an environmental consideration. And this, this is a, a really interesting thing. Okay, many excreted, <laughs> this is from Stephen Herod Booner in The Lost Language of Plants. Many excreted pharmaceuticals and their metabolites are not biodegradable. But that's because when they make some of these synthetic drugs that are not compounds that were ever found in nature, they're making them so that they will have a long-lasting effect in the human body, which means the human body doesn't know how to metabolize them. So it excretes them whole. And they go on getting in the environment and producing that effect in the environment forever. Many of that do biodegrade are regularly replenished by the need people continually taking them or by prescriptions for new people. And as the pharmaceuticals are excreted in pure and metabolized forms, they also intermix with the waste and streams that flow into the environment in, in ways that we that cannot be predicted with effects that are not understood. For instance, in a recent study conducted by the Environmental Protection Agency, samples of wastewater from 50 large-sized wastewater treatment plants nationwide were tested for 56 drugs, including oxycodone, high blood pressure medications, and over-the-counter drugs like Tylenol and ibuprofen. More than half of the samples tested positive for at least 25 of the drugs monitored, with high blood pressure medications being the ones they found the most. Almost all water supplies now in major metropolitan areas are laced with minute doses of, of, of estrogens, uh, high blood pressure medications, antidepressant drugs, and so forth. This is becoming an extremely big problem of pollution. And, and uh, Stephen Harry Booner in his book devotes quite a bit of problems. This is, there's an environmental hazard to pharmaceuticals, whereas herbs being natural components in the the uh, nature get recycled and broken down naturally. And even with antibiotics, which I do think there's times when you use antibiotics, the, the overuse of antibiotics has caused all these antibiotic resistant strains of, of microbes, and including it's the use of antibiotics getting fed to animals and the microbes mutating that causes some of these vicious strains of E. coli that sometimes show up in the food chain. So, uh, you know, the 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 ultimate answer uh, environmental friendly medicine is local herbs. Herbs that are, are either grown by people in, in, in gardens or on farms or are, are sustainably har harvested from the I mean, uh, David Winston did this wonderful webinar for the AHG recently, The Worst Weeds Are Your Best Medicines, talking about the fact that there's large numbers of plants that are considered to be invasive weeds that actually could be used as medicines for a wide variety of health problems. Um, unfortunately, however, uh, I, and this is again, you know, being a little critical of, of the modern herb industry, um, the the tendency for us to focus on magical plants and magical cures and here's the latest you know uh, super herb or whatever that we do because it's all great marketing uh, causes you know certain species to get like devastated uh, in in harvesting um, and so this is the uh, uh, United Plant Savers at risk list like ginseng in the, is you know in in China there's they can't find ginseng in the wild anymore because they basically harvested it to extinction. They can only cultivate it. Uh, in America, the same thing is happening. Black cohosh is being way over harvested. Echinacea uh, angustifolia is now basically wiped out in every state but Montana. 
from from unscrupulous people just harvesting it. Golden seal is you know becoming rarer and rarer in the wilds. It's you know most of it's now being woods grown because they can't do it. There's lots of herbs that because people get hung up on the idea that that oh it's this magic herb that does the trick instead of understanding that herbs have certain actions and herbs are actually act, there's a lot of interchangeability in herbal medicine and a lot of local remedies actually can be used but it's always kind of human nature to think that something that comes from Africa or South America or Australia or whatever has got to be better than something growing in my own backyard any comments on that um, Thomas before we wrap up this one no, I, I would just say, yeah, I, I would say that uh, if, if you're going to get involved in herbs, you need to keep this list with you. It's updated uh, yearly or so. And uh, don't buy these products commercially unless you know that they have been cultivated or, you know, ethically harvested and replanted on private land. So um, most of the big companies do a good job with that, but learn how to use uh, the uh, other herbs that would be interchangeable. You know, like echinacea is a wonderful plant, but there are many other plants that will do very similar things. Uh, same thing with golden sill. In fact, golden sill, it's really easy to interchange that with uh, other berberine containing plants. So learn this list and learn how to use other plants um, with the, the same type of action. So Thomas, I'm going to let you finish up with talking about the eclectic pr approach, since you're the eclectic herbalist. <laughs> okay. So um, the eclectic physicians were a they were a group of physicians that practiced in America from the 1830s, 1840s to the 1930s, and uh, there were thousands of them. They had uh, many journals. They wrote lots of books. Um, I've been slowly building my library over the years and learning more about their approach and uh, and they were really disliked by the physiomedicalists and homeopaths and the allopaths and the chiropractors and pretty much everybody disliked them because they felt like the eclectics would just steal their remedies and uh, the eclectic approach was uh, we don't care where it comes from we don't care what tradition it comes from as long as it's helping our patients improve uh, it's worth using and uh, you know, I, I, that's the personal approach that um, I've adopted in my practice. And, uh, you know, a concept to think about here is before 100 years ago, the word herbalist really wasn't used that much. You know, people that used herbs did not identify themselves by the fact that they used herbs. They were healers. They were doctors. They were shamans. They were, uh, you know, medicine men using herbs was just one part of their healing repertory. Okay? Um, and uh, so they, they would use herbs, but they would also say, hey, you know, have you thought about this lifestyle issue? Or this herb's not strong enough, enough let's use this, um, this you know, toxic mineral. Or, or you know, uh, maybe your problem isn't uh, something that herbs can fix, maybe you need uh, to move to a better environment, or maybe you need to get a different group of friends, you know. There's so many different avenues of healing that are very effective. Uh, I don't think we should limit ourselves to just one. And uh, I, I honestly wonder about identifying ourselves uh, via just one avenue of healing. So, you know, I call myself the eclectic herbalist and my school is the eclectic school of herbal medicine and that's because their approach is one that I can I really resonate with and that's I don't care where it comes from I don't care who invented it or uh, what dogma it has behind it I'm going to choose to have no dogma I'm going to use what works for myself and my loved ones and my clients uh, no matter where it comes from so if that means sending somebody to a doctor for antibiotics or to a homeopath for a remedy, or to uh, a church for prayer, or to uh, a you know, massage therapist for a massage, it doesn't matter to me. As long as people are getting better, then I'm fulfilling my job, which is not as an herb salesman, or even just as an herbalist, but it's as a healer. And uh, I think that's what many people in this profession aspire to, and they let 
uh, they let these preconceived ideas and notions and, and ego get in the way. And uh, I would, you know, encourage all of you to let go of that and uh, be open to using whatever works without uh, taking on the dogma of that approach. So my thought is we've got it backwards. Herbal medicine shouldn't be alternative health care. It should be primary health care. Because to me, it makes sense to try the least toxic, least invasive, and gentlest remedies first, and then save stronger, more toxic, and more invasive remedies as alternatives if the simpler approach doesn't work. So my particular thing is kind of like this. This is the way I think. The first thing I think about, this is the first thing I think about if I'm having a health problem is, okay, how is my life out of balance? Am I not getting enough sleep? Am I not eating right? Am I not exercising? Am I not managing my stress? What's going on in my life that's causing this? My first thought is not, what pill do I take? It's, I assume that my lifestyle is out of balance somewhere, and I'm going to try to figure out how to bring it back into balance. In that process, I will then also take a look and say, okay, uh, there are some, you know, herbal remedies. I'm not talking about toxic botanicals, but just the, you know, the kinds of herbal remedies sold by herb companies or homeopathics or a vitamin and mineral supplement or some body work or some first aid treatment that I could give myself as some kind of basic, you know, low invasive, low toxic, you know, very safe therapy to see if I can also help that process of bringing my body back into balance. Now, if... Uh, if my body is far enough out of balance or my client that I'm working with is far enough out of balance or there's a serious enough problem, I may switch to stronger therapy. Um, I'll, I'll use curcumin. I'll, uh, Nature Sunshine just came out with a supplement called Equilibrium that contains a, a nutraceutical called Equal, which is a isoflavoin. And I started taking it because I have tried a lot of other therapies and haven't worked very well for prostate thing, and that's been working very well for me. Hopefully, as I continue to work on my other issues, I'll eventually get to the point where I don't need to take it anymore. That's my goal. My goal whenever I'm using that is, can I use that to help me get back into balance while I figure out how to keep myself there? And then sometimes... Uh, you know, sometimes surgery is appropriate. Sometimes over-the-counter and prescription drugs are appropriate. Sometimes invasive therapies are appropriate way to deal with things. And and you ought to recognize that when a person's, you know, far enough out of balance and is in serious enough condition that some of these other therapies may be helpful. Um, and Thomas, do you have any comments about that before we wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I, the the foundational therapies I think are the key. I, I just I was thinking I had a, a student that texted me um, today and said, "Hey, do you have anything that you know? Do you, do you know any herb that will help me shut my brain off it? You know, so that I can get some rest uh, or or you know shut my brain off without making me sluggish?" And uh, um, I you know thought of twenty herbs that would do that, and my response was. Uh, have you been meditating lately? And uh, he said, no, I haven't, but I need to start back. That worked really well. And so, you know, you should go towards these foundational therapies before anything else, using herbs and, uh, and uh, then the stronger therapies if needed to move you back in balance. But I, I teach about the basic therapeutic guidelines, and they are, are based around the diet and stress management and sleep and exercise. And uh, without those things, uh, no real healing will occur. In fact, I don't think you're, you're actually practicing healing arts unless you're emphasizing the balance that those basic foundational therapies bring. Right. Okay, before we answer questions, and there's actually been quite a few questions, and I'm going to want to try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, I want to tell you about some upcoming uh, events. Uh, on Monday, not a lot of notice, but on Monday, Thomas is going to be teaching the first part of a two-part class, Four Keys to Understanding Blood Chemistry. Thomas, you want to tell them a little bit about what you're covering there? Um, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I have spent years um, learning uh, 
uh, naturopathic and functional medicine approaches to interpreting blood work and I'm going to share with you the the things that I use most frequently in my practice um, very simply you have to have the right fuel you have to have uh, enough oxygen for combustion you have to have uh, uh, your filters working properly and you have to have uh, your thermostat set correctly or your your gas pedal if you will your your hormonal control. So we're going to talk about the commonly used blood test, uh, uh, blood chemistry panel, uh, a standard Chem 14 and uh, CBC um, to determine uh, kind of from a functional perspective or a predictive uh, perspective um, how well your your glucose is staying regulated, how well your uh, red blood cells are delivering oxygen to the cells properly, how well your filters are working, and how well your thyroid, which is kind of the hormonal control of combustion, is working. And those are the four areas of imbalance that I see most frequently in my practice. We're also going to touch on, uh, along with the, the fuel and the glucose, we're going to touch on uh, the digestive system and some markers there. And so it's just an easy way to kind of screen for and uh, another tool to add uh, to helping you assess what the root of the problem is. Yeah, and so if you're interested in uh, attending that class, you uh, register at treelight.com or you can call uh, tomorrow because we're closed right now, 800-416-2887. Uh, also in July, I will be teaching our herbal preparations and applications class by webinar, which is about how to make all this herbal stuff and all these different ways you can, you can prepare and use herbs. The registration for that is not online yet, but uh, you can call. I, I will be sending out emails about that a little bit later. So with that, let's to the question. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, first of all, because several people have asked some questions about the multivitamin thing, because I know people get shocked when I say this. but So I'm going to say it again. There is no such thing as a whole food multivitamin because it would be food, not a pill. <laughs> so, okay. so all all vitamins that you buy commercially are uh, derived from the bacterial or fungal fermentation of a food source. Most food sources are sugar, corn, things like that. There are some companies that ferment fruits and vegetables to derive their um, their vitamins, but it's still a, a, a not a naturally occurring in the food. They just add some food to the vitamin to make it look like it's more natural. But yes, all yeah. commercially available vitamins are um, synthetically derived. And there are about four or five companies that make those synthetically derived vitamins, and then various companies buy them and assemble them to make their own supplements. Okay, and they test the you know I mean then companies test the quality of the incoming materials and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying, and, and I'm you're talking to someone who I do uh, occasionally you know uh, take a, uh, something that's got some vitamins and minerals in it because I I feel I need a little boost to my system. But I don't look at that as the same as as eating whole natural foods. So I, I just want you to be aware that there's no such thing as a uh, whole food vitamin and mineral supplement. It just doesn't exist. The the best the best way to to, to it, we're we're again talking about gradations of things and you know whatever gradation you're choosing to work on that's what you're choosing to work on I just want people to be aware that I really think that whole foods and whole herbs should be the core of what we do and the other stuff you move out and utilize as you have more and that's all I'm uh, going to say um, I just I, I don't actually I do recommend vitamins and minerals for specific therapeutic purposes for you know specific reasons but I do not uh, I've never been a big advocate of just taking a bunch of vitamin and mineral supplements okay now uh, some people also again said some things about the essential oils and uh, Thomas and I uh, did a webinar 
last night on essential oils as part of our member program and also I did one on 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 Tuesday night and I I know that doTERRA and Young Living and a number of companies are really advocating you know taking essential oils internally uh, but you because those are really really concentrated substances you've got to be really really careful with that they can irritate your gastrointestinal uh, tract they can uh, you know cause problems one of the people uh, who's on the thing commented that they read that one drop of peppermint oil ha has as much essential oil as 75 cups of peppermint tea which sounds to me about right <laughs> uh, so so uh, when you can get your stomach settled by a cup of peppermint tea that's a heck of a lot safer gentler and easier way than taking a drop of peppermint oil so therefore why not always go to the more whole safe and gentle remedy first we have this really weird mindset in our culture to to want to pull out these big guns this strong stuff this fast acting stuff because we're i think it's because culturally we're impatient we're we're in a hurry we want quick fixes we don't want to have to really stop and take a look at our life and what we're doing and think about changing it and we just want some magic pill to make us better and i think it's a, a learning to to thomas you've made this comment about people you know just the, the act of brewing the tea is part of the medicine, right? Yeah, you know, I, we're, we're so disconnected from the healing ceremonies that indigenous people all around the world do and that every culture has, and those healing ceremonies are part of the process. Sit down and have a cup of stinking tea and relax while you do it, you know. Don't shove it down your throat in a capsule and go on your merry way. Yeah. Now, when the word bovine is in a formula that means it's derived from a cow okay so when you have a, like bovine adrenal or bovine thyroid or whatever it means that that is they've taken the adrenal glands from a cow or and they've freeze dried it and powdered it and put it in a pill okay um Yes, there are organic uh, essential oils. Okay, flower remedies and homeopathics are very, very gentle remedies because you're basically, uh, you're talking about remedies that are working on an energetic level rather than a chemical level, where you're trying to capture that elusive energy of the plant rather than, than the, uh, the chemical substance of a plant. So, for example, I talked to Patricia Kaminsky at FES Services and they calculated that a that um, that the flower essences that they sell are diluted one to one point uh, eight million so in one point eight million drops of their finished flower essence there is one drop of plant extract and that's basically, you know, homeopathic. So that's why they're very, very safe uh, remedies. Okay. Um, now, standardization of an extract, as in four to one, or, or is it like one to four, or or one to five, is not actually. Uh, it, there's there's two kinds of standardizations in making herbal products. One is where you you're using a standard process with a set. Uh, procedure to make a set strength of the product and the other one is where you're standardizing the extract in order to try to concentrate certain phytochemicals and leave other parts of the plant behind so when you say a one to four you're actually talking about that you had one ounce of herb for four ounces of whatever extraction medium you were using which is a which means that you're you're getting a, a, a whole plant extract although anytime you make a tea or a decoction or whatever you get a slightly or a tincture you get a slightly different mix of the phytochemicals depending on what how, how the soluble they are but but that was taken into account a lot with traditional medicine they 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 learned you know by experience some of the best ways to 
to prepare herbs. So you can basically uh, uh, study that. If you want some good places for, for herb seeds and starter plants, my personal website, stephenhorn.com, I think I've put a, a few places where I've bought uh, herbs and, and uh, plant seeds. <laughs> where do we start if we'd like to reform the entire medical system? <laughs> With ourselves. Uh, Thomas, what do you want to say about that? I was, I was just going to say in your own kitchen. Uh, um, yeah, because uh, we we ref we reform the system like one uh, person at a time. Um, uh, as 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 the if the public de as the public demands change, uh, the system will change uh, along with the consciousness of the people. Um, now now I want to just th th there's some questions here. I know some of these are like kind of personal questions, but I really do want to, I, I don't want to like answer questions like, you know, about brand products and everything like that, because this is meant to be a generic thing. But someone was saying, um, you know, uh, as a woman over 60, I know I need to take high doses of calcium. Uh, where can I find foods high in calcium? And could whole foods be used to replace calcium supplements? Thomas, do you want to take that? Because I... Because first of all, you don't need high to yeah, be taking, absolutely. taking high doses of calcium. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. That, I mean, so uh, the studies show that um, you have a higher overall mortality rate by taking calcium than by not taking calcium. If you want to build your bone density, half your plate should be covered in green vegetables. You should take two to five thousand IU's of vitamin D, uh, of vitamin D a day, or get enough sunshine to bring your blood levels of vitamin D above 40 nanograms a milliliter, and you should get weight-bearing exercise daily. Those things will build bone density, not swallowing calcium pills, of which even if you had perfect digestion, your body could only absorb about 200 milligrams at a time. The rest of it's just going to kill your stomach acid and uh, inhibit you from digesting all your other nutrients. So. I honestly cannot remember the last time I recommended a calcium supplement to anyone, period, across the board, and yet I consistently see women, even on DEXA scans, go from negative 5 and negative 6 to a negative 1, okay, which is a, a tremendous improvement uh, simply by exercising and eating better and getting enough sunshine. And uh, I will say I have... Um, a medical doctor that's in my herb school right now, and she's recommended nettle tea for low bone density for years, and uh, says that it works wonders, and she's had thousands of women using a, just a nettle tea uh, build their bone density and prevent fractures. So, you know, don't take calcium. Okay. Someone mentioned about the fact that they, they do vitamin B12 injections, and, and Thomas, we might want to mention that part of the reason why sometimes you have to go to the, the the synthetic or isolated compounds is because some people do have problems with metabolism or utilization of certain nutrients, right? Yeah, and I, I, I take vitamin B12 injections. You know, my vitamin B was really poor. I have a genetic trait that makes it very difficult for me to absorb B12. I had poor digestion for years, so I've taken B12 shots now uh, for a couple of years, and it does wonders. You have to take into account, you have to treat the person, not numbers on a page and not dogma and philosophy. You have to take every case on an individual basis, and there's sometimes things like B12 are needed because of, uh, you know, they've let their health get so far, they have genetic issues or things like that. So we're not saying that those things are horrible. We're just saying that for most people, using a whole plant-based, uh, you know, natural food-based remedies is a healthier alternative. Yeah. It's like someone, you know, mentioned about, is Nature's Harvest okay? I use Nature's Harvest, make smoothies, you know. I, I I stick a little protein powder in with some whole milk yogurt and some fruits I freeze and whatever and and make smoothies. I like it. You know, I mean, what I'm saying is is that you you want to be aware that you want to move as you know closer to the whole foods. Like, for example, one year I felt like my family needed some extra vitamin C, but rather than running out and buying about you know chewable vitamin C tablets for my kids, I went out and bought a case of oranges. 
I fed oranges to my kids because I figured that they would actually get better vitamin C and more utilization of vitamin C by eating the oranges than they would by taking vitamin C tablets. That's all. Um, okay. And for those of you who are asking, you know, specific uh, uh, questions about specific uh, therapeutic things, I, w I really don't like to try to get into doing individual consults in in a, in a class because usually to to give a good recommendation about a specific health problem, you got to talk to the person, get more information. Uh, otherwise, you're 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 really not going to get really good advice. So. Um, You'd have to like eat, contact Thomas and I, you know, individually, uh, or set up a consult or something if you want, you know, individual help. Um, so everyone, thank you all for participating in this webinar. Hope you got a lot of uh, useful information out of it. Uh, I think we've reached kind of the end of our time, and uh, uh, thanks to all of you who uh, asked um, questions, and hope that this has given you some food for thought about you know, why I still primarily reach for herbs rather than other things, uh, uh, along with whole foods and, and lifestyle changes as a major way of dealing with health problems. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. Good night.